Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing the basic concepts of DNA. This is going to be a very high yield topic, a very high yield lecture, because it is going to be creating not only the building blocks of your understanding, but it's also going to be very important for the building blocks of the pathology and the disease processes that you will be learning as you are progressing through your medical education. So with that being said, let's dive right in and let's talk about DNA. DNA is very important. It is essentially your genetic code. And the reason why it is important other than the fact that it's your genetic code is because it is making up the basis of everything, everything in your body. Nothing can happen without DNA because your DNA tells every cell essentially, essentially how to behave and how to function. Now, when it comes to DNA, it is mainly located in the nuclei of eukaryotic cells. There are exceptions to this because there is also DNA found in mitochondria known as mitochondrial DNA. Now, DNA itself is a polymer, polymer, polymer of nucleotides. That's a tough word. It is a polymer of nucleotides. These are your nucleotides right here. And nucleotides are built up of three main components. Number one, you have the sugar backbone. The sugar backbone is a ribose-based sugar right here. This is the structure of a ribose sugar. So this is the backbone of DNA. And why is that important? Essentially, without this backbone, without the sugar backbone, our DNA wouldn't really have the structure it has. This helical shape is because of the fact that these strands, the helix backbone is made up of ribose connections, okay? That's why it's very important, number one. Number two, you have the nitrogenous base. The nitrogenous bases allow DNA to bind uh, multiple strands. So if you have two uh, main structures, two main DNA strands, backbones of which are formed by the ribose sugars, the nitrogenous bases allow these two strands to bind together, and that is what gives DNA the main shape we are dealing with, the double helix shape. And then finally, you have the phosphate group right here. Now, this is very important, so we're going to dive a little bit deeper and discuss what is the difference between a nucleotide and a nucleoside, okay? Very, very easily forgotten. This is something that a lot of people forget, and a lot of people get confused. I don't blame you. Um, I It happened to me, too until, honestly, I committed it to memory. The way I recommend you memory, memorizing this is by just memorizing one main thing. Memorize either nucleotide or nucleoside, and once you know that one concept very well, the other one is the other one. No one, and the other one is the other one. So a nucleotide. A nucleotide has a sugar backbone, like this right here, which is the ribose sugar. It has the nitrogenous base. However, it also has the phosphate group right here. A nucleoside, on the other hand, has the sugar backbone and has a nitrogenous base, but it does not have the phosphate group. There is no phosphate group in a nucleoside, okay? That's it. The way I also remembered it is in a nucleoside. The phosphate group is not bound to the actual molecule, but instead the phosphate group is on the side. Nucleoside, phosphate group on the side. I hope that makes sense. I hope it's easy. I always memorized nucleoside. I, I never thought about a nucleotide, honestly, but I did know that the phosphate group was always on the side. If I remembered that, then I could easily recall that a nucleotide contains a phosphate group. Pretty straightforward. So these nitrogenous bases are very important because you have five main bases you need to know and you need to commit to your memory. Two of these are classified as purines and they're called purines because they essentially have these two ring structures right here. And those two are adenine and guanine. Adenine, guanine. These are your two main nitrogenous bases you need to know in terms of purines. And then the other three are pyrimidines. Pyrimidines have the, uh, the nitrogenous bases of cytosine, thymine, and uracil. Okay, so... These three right here are called pyrimidines because they only have a singular ringed structure, whereas purines have two rings in them. Pyrimidines have one ring. I don't know why I wrote one twice, but one ring. One ring to rule them all. If you guys are Lord of the Ring fans, I hope you appreciated that joke. I don't make many of those jokes, but hey. You got a joke right there. So let's talk about nucleotides. Remember, nucleotides are not nucleosides. That means the phosphate group is bound, 
okay, because the phosphate is not on the side, nucleotide. Okay, so nucleotides, uh, essentially their name is going to change from the nitrogen's base names, okay? So remember, adenine is this molecule, and nucleotide is known as adenosine, okay? Guanine was this molecule, and the nucleotide name is guanosine, okay? So I'm going to write this out for you. Adenine is going to become adenosine, guanine is going to become guanosine, cytosine is going to become cytidine, thymine, thymidine, and uracil, uridine. So how do I remember this? Essentially, the purines have the suffix S-I-N-E, sine, and the pyrimidines have the suffix D-I-N-E, dine. Well, I have a mnemonic. You're welcome. Get ready because I'm going to embark some knowledge on y'all so you can remember how to differentiate these two. Other than, the, other than the basic fact that the adenine and guanine, which are, remember, purines, um, essentially are keeping the same prefix, right? And then the pyrimidines are also keeping the same prefixes. I also remember the uh, the suffix. The suffix can be essentially remembered by thinking that you want to dine at the pyramid. That means pyrimidines are uh, contain the suffix d i n e dine. Okay. Remember the nucleotides in this case contain both the phosphate group and the ribose sugar along with the nitrogenous base. This is what they look like. The name of the nucleotide is going to be dependent on the nitrogenous base that is binding to them. And these are all going to be synthesized as monophosphates, meaning they only have one phosphate group on them, not multiple phosphate groups. If you have multiple phosphate groups, for example, adenosine only has one phosphate group. So technically, another name for adenosine, and I'm about to blow your guys' mind away, is a M P because it is a monophosphate. What happens if you have adenosine plus two phosphate groups? You will get adenosine triphosphate, ATP. Oh my God. Yeah, so important, right? ATP is very important. We'll talk about that later. But remember that nucleotides have only one phosphate. So technically AMP is a type of nucleotide. All right, and then they can be confer converted into the triphosphate form in order to be added to DNA. Now, when it comes to the DNA structure, it is composed of chromatin. Chromatin. Chromatin is essentially DNA plus proteins, and those proteins are known as histones. We're going to talk about these in a second. Histones are very important. DNA itself is found in the nucleus of, of eukaryotic cells. Now, when we're talking about chromatin, you also need to remember the concept of heterochromatin. Heterochromatin is highly condensed DNA, and the portions of your DNA that are not being transcribed or that are not being uh, essentially transcoded into uh, or active genes that are not being transcribed into proteins are going to be heterochromatin. They are going to be really highly condensed portions. Those highly condensed portions are very, very difficult for the protein molecules to get to to be able to transcribe the DNA to RNA. And they have a significant amount of DNA methylation. So heterochromatin has really high DNA methylation occurring. Why is this important? Because methylated DNA allows your DNA structure to be really tight. Those methyl groups allow for multiple binding. And when that binding occurs, it's really difficult for molecules to get inside to our DNA to be able to transcribe it. So high levels of methylation means low DNA transcription. To RNA. Now, you can also have something called euchromatin. Euchromatin is very, very important because it's essentially the opposite. Euchromatin has portions of uh, DNA that are less condensed. This portion of the DNA is where the genes are going to be getting transcribed, okay? That means these portions are going to be more open. It will allow transcription molecules to be able to bind the, to them much easier. It'll allow uh, DNA replication, and sorry, sorry, DNA transcription to occur much easily, and DNA can then be transcribed into RNA and then 
into proteins. And these uh, portions are going to have high levels of histone acetylation. When you acetylate a histone, right here, this is a histone molecule. When you acetylate this histone molecule, it will allow for looser DNA structure. Essentially, histones are what our DNA binds to to make more tighter DNA. Now, if you take away those histones, if you acetylate them, you will allow DNA to become more open, and that will give us an easier way for our DNA to uh, essentially be transcribed. And now chromatin gets very condensed into chromosomes. So when you're talking about chromosomes, this is the most condensed form of your DNA, okay? And that is because this is the form that your DNA needs to be in, especially during the cell replication cycle phase when your DNA is being not only duplicated but also being moved around. You can't have loose DNA there because, you know, think of it as two uh, headphone wires, right? If you have very loose headphone wires, you put them in your pocket, they're going to get, they're gonna get you know, looped up and they're going to get ruined. That's why you got to tighten them up and you got to make sure that they're pretty tight when you put them in, in, in your pocket so that ideally when you take them out, uh, they won't get tangled up. Obviously, this doesn't happen, but think of your DNA as uh, essentially think of the chromosome as the part of your headphone cable that you put into your pocket so that it's tightly wrapped around and it doesn't get messed up. That's why we have such tight binding occurring. It allows not only for easy movement of the DNA, but also prevents any damage happening to the DNA, along with the DNA methylation and histones that are present. So with that being said, uh, yeah, I wrote that right here too. The chromatin condensing of the chromosome mainly occurs in the cell cycle when the cell is replicating. With that being said, I hope this was helpful. Thank you so much for listening. Um, but we're going to be discussing more topics like this. So if you want to continue learning, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. And if you want to see more videos, go to our website, www.madmedicine.org, where you can find more lectures that are completely free for your educational purposes. Thank you.